Hello and welcome to Artos the Friendly Bear. Uh, my name's Glenn and thank you very much for clicking on this video and being here with me. Um, so this video is going to follow on from a previous video I've made called uh, Shakespeare's Coat of Arms uh, where I prove Edward de Vere uh, is the author of Shakespeare and many other works. Today we're going to take uh, one aspect of that a little bit further which is this emblem uh, Artos the bear holding his ragged staff there and we're, we're going to um, investigate it see where it leads us and then give you some new research you'll notice Artos uh, is featuring at the bottom uh, of all the videos that I've made uh, on this so far here he is uh, on Britain's Bower of Delights uh, which is a very uh, important uh, book which we'll have a look at um, in a little bit as well. So, uh, to find out a little bit more about Artos, I decided to go to Warwickshire County Council uh, because he features as an emblem of, of them. Uh, so this is what they say. The origins of these emblems are lost in the distant past, but have been associated with the Earls of Warwick since at least as early as the 14th century. William Dugdale, writing in the 1650s, said that Arthur Gold who's featured here, you can see uh, article, it's from a manuscript of the British Library. Uh, an Earl of Warwick at the time of King Arthur uh, thought his name came from the Welsh Artos, or Bear. He also suggested that the ragged staff was chosen because Morvidus, Earl of Warwick, killed a giant with a broken branch of tree. Of course, neither of these earls really existed and Dugdale was just recalling medieval legends. The bear was a common heraldic device and implied boldness and courage. Um, the bear and the ragged staff were first used by the Bouchamp family, who became earls of Warwick in 1268, as a badge or mark of identity, into addition to their own coat of arms. Uh, in 1387, Thomas Bouchamp II, earl from 1369 to 1402, owned a bed of black material embroidered with a golden bear and silver staff, which is the earliest known occurrence of the two emblems together. Richard Bouchamp, Earl from 1402 to 1439, has a crest supported by two bears, each holding a ragged staff. His tomb in the centre of Bouchamp Chapel on the south side of St Mary's Church has an inscription in which the words are separated alternatively by bears and ragged staffs. Then we come to this. Uh, fine looking gentleman here. This is Robert Dudley, the first Earl of Leicester. Um, he was a favourite of the Queen. Uh, he proposed to her, was her suitor for a number of years, had his bedchambers next to hers, um, was, a, was a strong favourite. Uh, he was the great 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 grandson, I think there was an extra great supposed to be in there as well, of Richard Bouchamp, is known to have used the combined device of the bear and the ragged staff frequently. Uh, it can be seen in many places on the walls of Leicester Hospital in Warwick, which he founded in 1571, good man, and on a chimney piece in his castle of Kenilworth. Uh, inventories of the furnishings of the castle mentioned cushions, bed covers and book bindings decorated with the design and his suit of armour now in the Royal Armoury. His heavily decorated, uh, is heavily decorated with ragged staffs. So this is the uh, said uh, chimney fireplace. Um, you will immediately, I'm sure, notice the ragged staff there um, across the uh, shield, the coat of arms. Now, the interesting thing is its orientation. It is oblique at a diagonal uh, direction. Uh, that's uh, quite interesting because Shakespeare's coat of arms also has a spear um, going across a bend here of the same orientation, the same direction. Um, you also may notice a uh, T there. Uh, we like T's. T's are important in this work. Uh, we have a D. Uh, this stands for Dwar et Loyal, uh, Right and Loyal, and Shakespeare's motto, Non sans droit. That's the same as uh, Dwar from Old French, meaning not without right. So a similar uh, motto there. If you have a closer inspection of that D, you also find that it terminates with two. Uh, v's, so your double V. Now, um, this this book here, Britain's Bower of Delight, containing uh, many most delectable and fine devices of rare epitaphs, pleasant poems, pastorals and sonnets by N.B. Gent. Um, N.B. Gent, uh, I believe, stands for Noble Gent, uh, which is a nom de plume 
of Edward uh, de Beer that he frequently uses and you'll see shortly. It also contains this really important poem uh, on of the birth and bringing up of desire by uh, Edward of Oxenford, uh, the Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. Uh, it's number 40, which is a very, very important number. And you'll see those double Vs that we've already just uh, seen. De Vere, uh, another uh, sign that the work is by de Vere. Uh, that also features, that poem also features in this very important book, which started all of this for me when I accidentally found it, uh, which is The Art of English uh, Posy. Um, in it, it has a printer's preface uh, saying it's by uh, Richard Field, or implying it is, but this RF at the bottom, but it's not. Um, if one has read The Art of English Posy, uh, and you go back to it, it becomes quite apparent that this is really by the author of this work. This work was published without any author's name, uh, as this does uh, say. Um, and if we inspect it a little bit more, you will find some really interesting features of it. There's a key there. You have first person admissions. I dare conceive them. Um, a feat of mine own simple faculty. Um, I doubted how well it might become me. Um, and myself a printer. So he's telling you that he is, he is this printer. We also have nothing. Edward de Vere is frequently uh, represented uh, by nothing. Um, so bare title without any author's name, purport so slender a subject as nothing could almost be. Um, humbly I take my leave. Uh, we also have love, any, uh, any worldly thing besides love. So we know love is really important, love and desire. And we also have May, the fifth month, um, which also uh, makes an appearance. Now, the reason I'm, I'm saying this is because you have um, loads of meaning here, which directly then corresponds uh, to that poem that you've seen before. So he's saying, I am the author of this book by linking thematically a lot of these um, keys to the poem. And you'll see that in a second. So uh, in the previous chapter, he invites you to guess upon the name of this author of, of the Art of English Posy. And he answers that question for you in the figure of response. Uh, so here we have uh, the poem uh, that you've already seen. And here you actually only have a section of it. Um, the rest of it is in Britain's Bower. Uh, under his name. This is only a segment of this poem. And here are all uh, the thematic keys that link to that important printer's preface. There's a key for you again. You have the first person admission. I set down some part of these verses. Your nothing is your devoid there, devere, devoid. Your love and desire. Uh, you can see Cupid, desire, love, uh, you have your may and your maid. So you have all of those thematic keys from the printer's preface in the figure of response, which is telling you that the art of English poetry is by Edward de Vere. It confirms his identity. There's actually loads of things that I, I missed. And as this research has continue, uh, continued, I now see um, inattentional blindness. Didn't know what I was looking for, so I didn't see it. So Io uh, from Greek mythology, uh, the um, priestess that's turned into a cow, uh, and then uh, metamorphoses Pfizer's back. Um, the day, the John Day, if you've watched um, the, the video on uh, Edward de Vere's life dates, uh, day is very, very important. You can see, uh, for those of you familiar with some of the work I'm doing, or uh, Anne, which are uh, Anne translated in Latin is or. Um, so you've got all of those. You've got your conceited ease. Um, your qualifying ease or ease of conceit, as I like to call them, uh, which it's the figure of addition. It's telling you uh, that uh, Edward is doing something uh, quite clever. Uh, you've got your hope and you've got your T and your double L. So you've got you've got so much going on. And your noble gentleman, which you saw from before, your nom de plume is their noble uh, gentlemen. So you've got so much, a nexus of meaning there, wealth of meaning in this poem telling you that it is Edward de Vere. And this is in chapter 19. This, this revelation of his, his identity is in chapter 19. Uh, so 
Um, if we have a look at uh, Mr. Robert Dudley's um, coat of arms, you'll see there's a nice, um, nice moon there in the centre. Um, that will make an appearance shortly. So here's Britain's Barrel of, De uh, of Delights, which we which we've uh, uh, talked about already, containing that really important poem by uh, the Earl of Oxford. Um, now, I accidentally and very fortunately uh, found this. Um, this is the Heroica Eulogia uh, from the Huntington Library, um, which is where it resides. Thank you to them for digitising it. And we have uh, this emblem of Robert Dudley. This is Robert Dudley, he even says his name at the top. There's his emblem uh, with his coat, and you'll see the little moon in the centre of it. Now, the reason why this is so important is if you have a look at who uh, it's um, by. It's by William Bower. And we have Britain's Bower of Delights. So you can start to see the connections here. We have Bower of Delights and Bower of Delights. But moreover, the Heroica Eulogia um, is dedicated to this newly created Earl of Leicester. The Queen uh, gave him a, a new peerage of the Earl of Leicester. And it's dedicated to him. And it has this uh, inscription in the front. Sometimes the truth comes to light unsought. And that is because, uh, well, I've, I've, I've tried to prove this. I believe I have uh, in my in my video, Shakespeare's Coat of Arms, that he's in fact the father uh, of um, Edward de Vere. And I'm going to show you some of that evidence again. Uh, if you have a look at the bottom here, Rosen Crown near Holborn Bridge. Well, that's important because... Um, uh, he, uh, Robert Dudley, is buried in St Mary's Church in Warwickshire. And if you have a look at his monument there, you will find some roses and some crowns and his emblem that he identifies with. This is probably why this emblem is on the front uh, of Britain's Bower of Delight, uh, which I've said I believe is, is by Edward de Vere. So if we also have a look a little bit more at his monument, um, well, we have the uh, Artos and Ragged Staff at the top um, and here as well we have them. But if we also look again, remembering uh, that oblique, that diagonal uh, orientation of the Ragged Staff, well, here we have a flag behind of the same uh, orientation. You'll notice that there is a T on that flag. Well, T is really important uh, because it well, it comes from the meaning of mark, and it is the mark of de Vere. Um, he actually gives you um, an admission of this in Ben Jonson's Execration of Vulcan, which again I, I talk about in, in my Leviathan of a video, which is Shakespeare's coat of arms. Um, if you can make it through the full uh, eight hours uh, and ever bump into me, I will happily buy you a drink if you make it through in one sitting. Uh, so if we count the number of uh, flags, we have one, two, three, four. Uh, we have four flags and we have that T. So we have our 40, our 40. That is the, the, the number, um, the sign of De Vere, 40, uh, which kind of is telling you <laughs> above his father's um, grave, that De Vere is here. So he's telling you, hey, this is my dad, right? It's all there for you. Uh, but there's more, there's much more. So there's the double V there again, which you saw on the fireplace. So you can see that these signs are consistent. This isn't just speculation. There is a consistency of these signs. Now, I believe Edward De Vere is um, uh, buried, well, I've proven, is buried underneath uh, Ben Johnson's grave in Westminster Abbey. Um, he is the only person standing upright in Westminster Abbey, which there are many, many references, not only in Shakespeare's work, but in the uh, the nine books that um, I showed you. Um, just notice that uh, that ragged staff is upright. That's, I think, um, also uh, pretty, pretty important, I think. Uh, but if you have a look, it's really important always to look um, what is adjacent to or around uh, what you're actually looking for. Directly um, in front of that, you have this grave. 
um, uh, this monument here, which is uh, to John uh, Hunger. Now, he wasn't originally buried here, but this was put here a little bit later. But if you have a look at the top there, you have your ragged staffs. If you have a look to the monument adjacent to that, well, who, well, what do we have? Well, we have our rugged staff. So you can see there's a, there's a rugged staff and Edward de Beers' uh, star there that he loves. Um, so you've got your rugged staff. And whose grave is that? Well, that's Sir Robert. Okay, that's one rugged staff. And the previous one, that's another rugged staff there. Are you, you going to do it a third time? Yes, I am. So adjacent to that on the wall, uh, you have this. I'm sure you can see this already. That is a ragged staff. It tries to uh, be concealed, but if you look at, if you're looking for it, and you know know what you're looking for, you can see that. Um, also, really interestingly, whose is that? It's Roberts. Uh, so you'll know uh, directly below that you have this two-headed eagle. This two-headed eagle, um, which is in the a, a book called *The Ascendants of Armory*, which is a very important uh, book. Um, you have this, he beareth, uh, beareth, could, it's equivocal on bearing a child, I believe. Uh, two heads, uh, you've got your Upton because he's standing upright. Uh, was born, uh, two eagles sat upon the house of his father, signifying unto him, saith he, a double empire. Okay, uh, so we've got these two eagles and we do have some eagles that are sat upon um, the house of his father a monument to his father and the emblem is of uh, the house of his father uh, you're also in the Minerva Britanna uh, have this the good husband that by experience knows with cunning skill to prune and where to plant where to put uh, must top the tree uh, where uh, ranked abundance grows uh, so you can see again we have this ragged staff um, of the tree and we also have a similar uh, one again in the ascendance of armory um, which is here vert via vert uh, the mighty buildings that acorns were the well we know it we know an idiom the acorn doesn't fall too far from the tree uh, and now uh, besides is a many uh, fold or man I fold lie spoken uh, the scriptures where I note when the children so not only do we have acorns but we have children there um, Lord is uh, with the thou mighty man of war well that's war is uh, very close to um, to Warwickshire isn't it um, so it's it's telling you it's telling you that ragged staff um, and the insinuations again that uh, Robert Dudley is indeed uh, Edward de Beers' father. Um, I give you a portrait in um, my previous video, and if, even if you just compare the similarity, he's got his father's nose. Uh, where have I take that he was made God's lieutenant? Well, um, I suppose Robert Dudley uh, was well. He was one of the most powerful men in the country, and and to one of one of the leading. Uh, people uh, with Queen Elizabeth, so could be seen as her lieutenant. Uh, if we have a look at some very, very, very important windows, uh, which I show you in my video, I'm just going to identify, I'm not going to talk too much about them, but um, uh, just notice the ragged staff in the windows uh, themselves, which are really important. Um, I say really important a lot in these videos, don't I? Um, so we have this book, and I'm very grateful to the De Vere Society and uh, Kevin Gilvery, who wrote a short biography on um, on Edward De Vere uh, for the De Vere Society's website, um, because I stumbled across uh, this and I immediately saw uh, the emblem of Artos the Bear on the front of Robert Dudley on the front, uh, on the front of Ovid's Metamorphosis. Uh, translated by one uh, Arthur Golding. Now, the first the first thing um, I want you to notice is on that bear, unlike on the the emblem on uh, Britain's Bower of Delights, you have the moon uh, from his coat of arms. 
Okay, so this is this is not just uh, Artos with his rugged staff, but you have the moon from uh, his father's uh, shield. Um, translated into Latin by Arthur Golding, you'll notice he's done something a little bit weird with a hyphen there. Um, imprinted in London by William Sears. Um, now, there's a lovely um, a quote in one of them, as the soul of uh, Euphorobus was thought to live in Pythagoras, so the witty soul of Ovid lives in mellifluous and honey-tongued Shakespeare. Um, so uh, Ovid, as I'm pretty pretty much sure all scholars agree on this, was arguably the most influential um, source um, and inspiration uh, for a lot of Shakespeare's plays. So, uh, Ovid features in virtually all of them. Um, the imprint of Ovid is there. Um, some scholars have even said that he must have known um, Ovid off by heart. Um, Francis uh, Mears, uh, that was by Francis Mears, William Sears. Well, that rhymes a bit, doesn't it? Um, just for a, for a bit of pathos, here's Arthur Golding's, uh, Golding's uh, uh, monument uh, where he's buried. And I just noticed this. I don't know when this was uh, put here, and I'm, I'm not uh, saying anything about it. But um, I just want to... I, I was just quite moved by that T. Because we, as we know, T's are very important. Just notice that the, the horns... Of the tea, look how low um, that they uh, they droop. I find that re that that really quite affects me actually. Um, I just think that's that's really um, interesting. Um, anyway, so back back to Ovid, which was translated by this Arthur Golding, um, or was it? Now, if if you've been following my work, you'll know I like uh, Ra's. Um, uh, Ra there, Ra the sun god, um, and we also have Golding, Golds, and uh, in my previous video we realised the importance uh, of gold. We're very much playing a golden game. So Arthur Golding is a is a very very good name uh, for this work. Now, um, the book that started uh, all of the voyage with with Shakespeare's coat of arms was the elements of armories that's the book um that if you see wit written brass part two um that i stumble across completely accidentally i should say um that i noticed there were a few commonalities that made me think actually this is this is by um edward de beer uh, i read some of it and had a quick flick through and um those those parallels and uh, were there, which made me think, okay, this, this probably is Edward de Vere. Now, I really wanted to read this, because after doing a little bit of work with the elementaire and the elements of uh, geometry, I was very keen, if Edward de Vere's writing a book with the word elements on, uh, to read it. Turns out that uh, I'm really glad I did, because uh, this book, um, which references many other books, is the key to ending the authorship uh, debate. Uh, Edmund and then uh, Colon, we like Colons, the um, the poem dedicated in the first folio has Ben Johnson uh, with a colon, it's a B-I um, or B-J in the uh, uh, the preface poem to the reader, to the reader, uh, I should have shown you a picture of that really, uh, but to the reader in the first folio which, uh, which is directly uh, facing the, uh, the picture, the portrait of uh, Shakespeare on the title page of the first folio. Uh, but a little bit later, he also writes a dedicated poem, and that is how he spells his name with the colon. Notice the colon. If you just flipped that uh, M upside down, we like transformations, um, that would be uh, EDW. So Edward de Beer, for instance. Um, or Edward, the first three letters of his name. Uh, Bolton's important, which I explained in the um, in the previous video, Shakespeare's Coat of Arms. Now, the interesting thing and how this relates is you have Ovid. You have a quote from Ovid at the bottom. How do I know this? Because in his table of hard words at the back, which is very important, and we'll look at in a second, very important, uh, and we'll look at that in a second, uh, you have this expression here, uh, quem dixere chaos. Um, 
So Ovid calls the rude and undignified first heap of natural elements chaos. In the impress uh, symbol or device upon the front of the book, uh, I have followed the common placing of the four common symbols um, and elements, which is what you've got here. You've got all the elements, fire, uh, air, water and earth, and then the tricking the colours uh, from armoury, which is what is there. These are the elements uh, of armoury, that which makes up uh, your armoury, or the colours anyway. Um, and we also have this and sable, oh, well actually in earth green, that's really important because green is vert, via, vert, and you'll see the conceited E on the end, and sable, sable is black, um, Edward de Vere is represented by nothing, black is the absence of colour, it is nothing, so we have uh, and sable, nothing, the sentence is out of some, uh, of some, the first Verses, verses, vers. The sable, the sentence is is out of some the first verses. So there's an error there. There's an error, and printing errors often indicate there's some cunning and conceit going on. He uses errors to tell you things within his books. Uh, and well, let's trans translate it. Uh, you notice it says in the metamorphosis there, uh, where it is said. And then here we have uh, our Latin. There was one countenance upon all of the world and which they call chaos now you're going to see that again uh, in a little bit um because that's um very very relevant uh so the sense of the whole impress is plain and sable this sentence is is out of some of the first verses the sense of the whole impress is plain it's being equivocal it's not necessarily talking about this impress it's talking about what is going on here. Now, just to um, quickly uh, show you that this really is by Edward de Vere, other than the fact it's dedicated to his cousin, he gives you many dedicated letters uh, that prove it is Edward de Vere who wrote this book. But uh, it's always important what people are pointing to. Uh, so if you have a look at what they are pointing to, they are pointing to Edward de Vere's coat of arms, uh, which quickly just proves it's Edward de Vere very simply and easily um, if you just look what they're pointing to. Um, now, I've not shown you this before but I want to talk a little bit more about this. In the back of um, the Elements of Armouries you have a table of some hard words and phrases with a few brief notes and I would encourage everyone to read this because it's it's really important, it's really um, telling uh, so we're going to have a look at it. Um, have so nearly as I could and even as much as Tiberius uh, Caesar, we like Caesar references, uh, himself who would not endure the words himself on the end would not endure the word monopoly uh, to monopolize something uh, because it was not latin avoided all uh, i like this word nd uh, if you flip that n it would be a v so evd edward de vere uh, nization of words which have moved me uh, in most places of my book to add other more clear uh, to interpret them such as may seem to the obscure, as thou mayst everywhere observe, for, albeit as in my epistle, I have such a reader as need not an interpreter. Yet I must not neglect such as I have, though there are scarce any words of mine, however they may perhaps seem strange, uh, which other writers uh, in our language have not formally made familiar, uh, other writers i.e. him, uh, he pretty much standardised English and gave us our first dictionary, uh, so indeed he has made them familiar. And these uh, few which are not altogether so, for which also I have more than once asked pardon in my book itself. Hmm. I have here for thy uses collected and by conference with the learned, so far only interpreted as is necessary to understand my meaning in the places where I use them, for to interpret the knee on the end, uh, them at large, and all their sense were to take uh, scapulars or uh, scapulars or Thomas's uh, offices out of their hands. My care is chiefly to have thee know mine out of their hands. My chief, uh, my care is chiefly to have thee know my hand, mine. Farewell. So this is important. Uh, it's wonderfully uh, ambiguous and equivocal. Uh, and you'll see why in a second. Uh, let's just have a look at a few of these words, though. Uh, so apostrophe, 
um, an abrupt or sudden turning of our speech from one matter or person to another, from one person uh, to another. Poets and orators are full of this vehement kind of figure. Um, well, actually, if you have a look here at the picture I've included, uh, you'll see uh, this knight here uh, and someone, a jester, um, at the bottom there. Um, I'd, 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 rec I'd, I'd suggest having a look at this manuscript because it's very interesting and does include some pointing hands. Uh, so an uh, antistrophe in Greek lyrics do signify other turnings or changes of speech and stations, changing of stations, maybe becoming a gentleman, for instance, uh, as we are taught in uh, Greek. Just notice that GR there, that, that GR for Greek. Uh, if we have a look at this one, this is for the Arctic, Arctic, art, artos, Arctic, uh, at that which of or appertains to the northern side of the celestial bear. OK, we're talking about celestial bears and we've got uh, Arctic. Oh, look, the variant spelling of Arctic there. Now that's got a C in. Circle is the bounds of the cold zone upon the Earth and uh, of the northern constellations. We have our or there. Uh, or in uh, heraldry is gold. Um, Constellations in, in heaven, the whole north is de, de vir, nominated, nom name, denominated of that imagined uh, figure. The fable of that bear is famous among poets. We're talking about the bear again. We're repeating it. You know it's important. So the Arctic, and we've mentioned Arctic again. Uh, hemi, me, me, with our, uh, your H is your E to your E sound. Um, hemi, uh, sphere. Uh, or close to spear, isn't it? Uh, uh, is that half of the world which is between the North Pole? North Pole would be, well, if you think about if you held a pole north, um, you could say that's also upright, and the uh, equinequital uh, lines, GRE. Ah, there's an E on the end of that. Now, I think this is really important. Why? Because we've got the E, and on all the other Greeks, you don't have that conceited E. Yeah? So that's the figure of addition. He's giving you that E to tell you something. And what he's telling you here is that the bear is famous. Um, it's important. It's, it's, it has significance. Um, and I also think this is referring to, given the fact that uh, he's buried in the North Isle of Westminster Abbey, uh, and the north windows are very, very important. Uh, that uh, this is also telling you um, the North Pole. He he's standing upright. So I think there's uh, an insinuation there as well. If we have a look at this arras, something that um, a, a cloth or tapestry that someone would hide behind, uh, and we have artois again, an arras in artois. Interesting, artos. Uh, Arthur, our toys. Uh, one of the 17, we like 17 because Edward de Vere is the 17th Earl of Oxford, and at this present is under the Archdukes, Albertus and his wife, Isabella. So why say that? If you think about why you're saying that, it, it's unnecessary. You're saying it because you're trying to signal, uh, um, signal something. Uh, so we ha have here... Um, where you've got the V, D and E, so Archdukes, and the Ra, the, uh, the Ra of Sun Gods, which is um, often personifies um, De Vere. So this is De Vere here. Uh, Albertus, well, that's quite close to Robert, isn't it? Bertus, Albertus, and his wife Isabella, Isabella Elizabeth. Uh, so Robert and Elizabeth uh, present is under the Archdukes. Uh, so he's he, again, he's kind of assinuating his parentage, and why? Because right after what you have, but bast bastard, a word in architecture, the bottom part of the column uh, or pillar, and figuratively the support, uh, support your stay groundwork or foundation of anything. Um, we also have a look at the word equivocal, which he defines. He defines the word equivocal because this is equivocal and you need to understand it's equivocal. 
Um, so an equivocal word is that which containeth more significations than one, or that which in the sense or meaning thereof doth equally extend itself. Meaning self, again, he's being, he's telling you, he's being equivocal even here. Um, as well as to one as to another, as the word arms in our vulgar use, uh, thereof doth equally signify those parts of our body so-called, uh, i.e. those things that hang from your shoulders, or weapons or tokens of honour uh, and tokens of honour, tokens of signs of honour, so who really has uh, signs, our... Um, and with an aspiration, uh, which is an Hellenic or deceit in accent, harms. So he's telling you, even, even for your ear, in harms, even though that's not said harms, arms is contained in it. Uh, notice this Hellenic, so that's Hellenic, Greek, but he's missed off the H and has the E there, Hellenic, emphasising that E, or deceit in accents. Um, where your, uh, your H there, immediately after, if you put an accent over the H, your eta, uh, and translate that from Greek, you will also get or, which is gold, which is very clever. So he's telling you that if you put an accent there and translate it in Greek, you get or. But there's more to that than, that, than this. Um, there's another level to it that we'll see. So if we go back to Edwin, uh, Edmund Bolton's, Edward De Beers, uh, Elements of Armouries, well, this book is so important. This was the first book that I, I read, which then referenced all the other books, um, which I then went and read, which will, I believe, and has, I think, uh, solved this debate already. So these are some of the really important books that they're referenced. These books are referenced within this book. So this really is um, a, a, a pinnacle of all these things tied together. Uh, within this book so it's so important I want as many people to read it uh, as possible and to become familiar with this um, so we can give uh, our rightful prince his due uh, so um, but also look at the front here we've already said we've we know this is from Ovid his elements chaos he, he's mentioned this he said this is in metamorphosis so the one book I've not uh, kind of looked at when he's been insinuating things is metamorphoses and so I thought actually I probably should have a look at this especially given because it has Artos on the front with the ragged staff and this moon um, hmm. so um, the first thing to notice Arthur Ra the Golding so already I'm I, I I'm pretty sure I already know what's going on here, but it's really important that we investigate. Uh, I have my thesis, but let's actually investigate. If we have a look here, a work very pleasant and delectable uh, with skill, heed and judgment. That's kind of a bit like the Bar Britain's Bar of uh, Delights, isn't it? With skill, heed and judgment, this work must be read for else to the reader. It stands in small stead. If you're familiar with my work, to the reader is a huge giveaway that uh, the book that you're reading is by Edward de Vere. Just from the title page to the reader and some of the errors uh, and, and his style of writing, you, you, you can quickly um, work out that it's Edward de Vere who's written uh, the book. So the to the reader, the fact that that's on the title page is already kind of um, got me quite attentive. Uh, let's also have a look, just to remind you of what was in the table of hard words in the uh, the elements of armories. Uh, for albeit, as in my epistle, I would such a reader as need not an interpreter, yet I must uh, not neglect such as I have. Just notice there um, that you have a 2A, 2A there, can you see that? And you've got A there, so you've got a 2 and you've also got a two there. Such a reader. So you do have to a reader in this line. Right, uh, before we go any further, I need to remind you of something that happened, because this was published in 1567. And in 1567, something happened to Edward de Vere that I would imagine would have had quite 
a uh, powerful impact upon him, which was this. On the 23rd of July, 1567, De Vere was apparently practising his fencing in the courtyard of Cecil House. Thomas uh, Brinknell, um, an undercook from the house, became involved. He was unarmed. According to the coroner's report, along came Thomas uh, Brinknell, drunk, ran and fell upon the point of the Earl of Oxford's foil, worth 12 pence, which Oxford held in his right hand, intending to play, as they call it, in the course of which, with this foil, Thomas uh, Brinknell gave himself a wound, gave himself a wound, to the front of his thigh, four inches deep and one inch wide, of which he died instantly. This, to the exclusion of all other explanations, was the way he died. Um, murder was a capital offence, yet the jury unsurprisingly, found Edward de Vere not guilty. Well, if Edward de Vere is uh, the son of Elizabeth I and Robert Dudley, that's not too surprising um, that he was uh, found not guilty as Thomas had committed suicide. But what do I know? I wasn't there. I don't know what actually happened. Uh, so I wouldn't like to speculate that he ha he has committed murder, but I, I would assume uh, something has gone on there because that seems awfully suspicious. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is you need to have that in mind, given it's the same date of publication, um, as uh, we go forward. Um, now, Arthur Golding was a tutor. He was the third tutor of Edward de Vere, um, and I'm sure has, as an as a incredible scholar, I'm sure, done some great work. Now, my thesis is that he's probably encouraged uh, Edward de Vere to do some translation. Edward de Vere is 17 at the time, so he's becoming quite independent, and he's a brilliant, uh, precocious young scholar. So I'm sure Arthur would have uh, encouraged him to do a bit of translation. Now, just for, imagine, ima uh, just for a minute, imagine uh, that this has happened. Uh, his parents, um, probably not too impressed, uh, with what has happened. Imagine the fallout from that. Imagine the consequences. I would imagine Edward de Vere is going to be spending some time in his room. And what do you think he might do uh, spending that time uh, probably reflecting uh, on his actions? Well, if we go forward and have a look now at this book, uh, I think some of it's going to make a little bit more sense. Now, the first thing before we start reading it, you have two things that start this book. The epistle and to the reader. Now, please do notice, and at the moment I saw this, I was like, oh goodness, something's going on. Uh, I was a little bit shocked uh, at first uh, because... I'd, I'd heard from things that I'd read and videos that I'd seen that everyone always said Arthur Golding was Arthur Golding's Arthur Golding's uh, translation. Edward de Vere may have translated a little bit. Um, my thesis is he's translated the whole thing. Uh, you can see the two and the two there. There's an extra O in to the reader. That was not on the front of the book. So already I can see some of the same conceit uh, that's been uh, in previous uh, books that I've, I've seen. That's the figure of edition. Uh, you can see it there. Most humbly to command Arthur Golding and to the reader. So already uh, I'm thinking, OK, De Beer is probably the author of this book. So let's let's keep on going. So we're going to we're going to have a look at this and actually have a look because there's some really, really brilliant uh, wit that's taking place within this book. Uh, now, the first thing here we're going to notice is who it's to. To the Right Honourable and his singular good Lord Robert Earl of Leicester, Baron of uh, Denra, Knight uh, of the Most no Noble Order of the Garter, and continue Arthur Golding, uh, gent wisheth uh, continuance of health with prosperity estate and felicity. Uh, so it's dedicated to his father. So this book is dedicated uh, to his father. Now also look, okay, because this is really interesting. 
Okay, if you have a look at all of these E's, they're of one type, but this one you have your epsilon. So you have a very, right in the centre of that line, you have uh, an E that differs somewhat uh, from the other E's. So it's just a little nod, a little nod, and that word estate is then, uh, by association, a little bit more important because of that E. Um, now, if we go forward, there's there's loads of stuff that's going on here. Um, I'm only going to do the first two pages, then I'm going to accelerate through this. I want you to go and read this uh, yourself, see this with your own eyes, and think about it. Uh, be critical. Um, don't always believe what I'm saying. Please don't. Be critical. Be doubtful. Go away and look at it. I'm pretty confident about this stuff, uh, but by all means, you go away and you read it. I need you. I want you to read this with your own eyes. Uh, so, uh, here, uh, length my chariot wheel, uh, the mark hath found the way, and at their weary races end, my breathless horses stay. Um, this work is brought to end, by which the author did account, and rightly, uh, with eternal fame ab above the stars to mount. Now, we can see uh, in uh, those in those two lines here, we have both, um, we have two twos. Now, we know this word two is important because in to the reader, uh, we saw this two. So, we can feel that a game has started to be uh, set up. So, let's play uh, this game and see where it leads us. Oh, so already we've got I mean, um, one of the next lines after that, uh, by sundry men uh, dis uh, dispersedly, dispersedly, by sundry men dispersedly. Well, sundry is one of my favourite buzzwords in this work. If I see the word sundry, uh, I'm awfully um, excited because I know uh, Edward de Vere is likely to have uh, a hand in it. Uh, so, if we continue, of this same dark philosophy, well, nothing. Dark philosophy, I like the word philosophy as well, particularly in the uh, in Shakespeare's coat of arms, we're talking about philosophy and virtue quite a bit. But nothing under heaven uh, doth a in steadfast state remain, nothing. In nothing doth remain, and next that nothing, again nothing, uh, perisheth that each substance takes. Another shape, another shape that it had. So nothing is taking another shape. Of these two points he makes, um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to start speeding through this because I, I want you to go and read this. Of souls of removing out of beasts to men and out of men uh, to birds and bears, uh, both wild and tame. Well, his father's emblem is a, a, a bear. Oh, it says beasts, actually, sorry. Uh, and his mother's is a bird. Uh, both to and fro again. Well, we have our two. Uh, well, we have another two. It is not to be understood. Uh, it is not to be understand of the same uh, soul whereby we are uh, in, in, endued with reason and discretion from on high. Uh, art uh, are found in things. The first gives oh, it's to uh, thine. Uh, it's quite difficult to read that bit. Um, the second giveth power to move and use of sense uh, f uh, fire. Uh, five senses, five. And we have a two there. So we're getting quite a lot of these twos. Well, you're going to see that in a second. Uh, oh, and it says a second at the time, which I'm not uh, going to count. And of the second doth contain the first. And of the second, two doth contain the first one. So that again, and of the second, two, doth contain the first, one. And then on the next line, both the other twain, both, which is two other twain, two. Um, and 
uh, neither beast nor bird, bear or, or uh, bird, phoenix, for instance. Uh, we have some more twos uh, that doth enforce return to air, uh, and of that air there may. We have some more twos of noble soul. Uh, I think it nothing less uh, that for to be a point of him uh, that wisdom doth uh, profess. We have another two. Uh, and finally, he doth proceed in showing that not all the bear that bear the name of men. That's clever because of the of Arthos. Uh, proceed in showing not all that bear the name of men. Um, bold hardly tell uh, of highly born. Goddess that again bear that name again here uh, are for to be accounted men. Um, reasons rule continually uh, do uh, live in virtues law. Um, so he's saying not to be accounted men, but need to live in virtues law uh, to natural philosophy. Uh, the uh, foremost, the uh, what's that say? Uh, pertain more to let's show the two more uh, uh, moral instructions which impose the praise of virtues. So someone's doing some reflection in the tale of Daphne turned to bay. Uh, a, um, what's that say? a major of virginity um, appeareth unto uh, May. Uh, repentance, when it is too late, that all redress is past. We're starting to talk about repentance and how the weakness and the want and wit in magistrates confoundeth both uh, his common weal and his own estate remember that estate with that epsilon um, and uh, fable also doth advise all parents and all such uh, to bring by youth take too good heed of cockering them too much it further uh, doth commend the mean and wileth, uh, willeth to beware uh, to another there and not uh, to her performed, and in fine it plainly uh, shows uh, sorrow to the parents and to all kindred grows. So sorrow to the parents, I'd imagine they were quite annoyed with him. Um, there's more there. There's a, is that prince? Again, his prince is bent. Uh, that claw, clawbacks. Well, he's trying to claw himself back, definitely. Uh, cool carries and uh, to beware. More to more to uh, and are uh, heart to reported ill okay so get ready because i'm just going to quickly go through this and show you now uh, all of the twos there are quite a lot of twos going on i'll stop and read the odd occasional one so uh, doth the tale of uh, niobe doth the tale of niobe and her children I wonder whether we know of any other Niobe references with a lot of twos in. Uh, I like this one, together. We'll come back to the Niobe reference, don't you worry. Uh, that folk are blind in things that to their proper um, wheel pertain. Well, hopefully you're starting uh, to see all of these twos that are going on. The uh, revenge, uh, the re uh, I think it's revenge and unnatural that was in mother's heart, uh, uh, the vengeance, sorry, most, the vengeance most unnatural, uh, that was in thy mother's heart, more twos, how uh, prince's sons, how prince's sons and noblemen, I'll just keep doing this, with prince's sons and noblemen, their youthful years should pass, uh, two, 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 uh, oh, so this is interesting. Uh, the secret uh, sins that folk commit in corners uh, uh, or by night. And here we have, uh, and secret all corners by his wits, uh, what may mind him out. Well, I know corners are important. Now, actually, it looks like the corners of this page may have been uh, slightly torn. So I would have liked to have known what was 
um, on these corners. But if we have a look at this, this is also, I think, a little bit interesting because we have an eye here. Uh, there's a slight bend to this eye, actually, and this one seems a bit straighter. But if you think about it, that eye is also quite E, epsilon E in nature. And if we have a look at the next page, you have this, which is supposedly of, but it doesn't seem to be joined. And uh, sorry if you can't see it too well. Uh, I think that might be a D, F, D, F, so E, D, F, maybe. Um, that's speculation, though, so and I wouldn't want to uh, speculate. Uh, so uh, two, 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 with a two with a double O on the end there. Um, two, two. Two, 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 Express. Well, I have mentioned Kippus about the horns who didn't want uh, to be uh, king of Rome. Um, so very wily and cunningly managed to get himself banished. So he didn't have to do that. And on the front of the city gates of Rome has some ox horns uh, inscribed, which you will find frequently. Um, you will find those ox horns um, all over the place uh, on the front of Shakespeare's work. Um, uh, that turning to a blazing star, Julius Caesar shows that fame and immortality of virtuous a doing grows. So we're talking about virtue here. So someone is really reflecting on his own virtue. We've got quite a few uh, more twos going on. To signify, I think uh, it is. There seems to be quite... A lot of... Oh, he's, he's still going, isn't he? Okay, yep, okay. Two, 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 two. Okay, uh, this uh, word Prometheus signifies a person sage and wise of great foresight uh, who heedily will nothing enterprise. Uh, it was the name of one that first did images uh, invent. Uh, so perhaps uh, Mr. Edward has been a little bit too uh, big for his boots, um, as I think one of his, his second tutor uh, may have alluded to. And perhaps he's reflecting on his own virtue and the fact that maybe uh, he should leave himself out of his work uh, and become nothing. Um, so two, two, two. We've got some more twos. Now ourselves to know our own estate. Know ye. I think he's trying to know himself a little bit better, as that we be not born um, to follow just or serve the... What's that say? I don't know. Um, a bit more. Uh, two, two, two. Uh, also, right, now, here's where we get really interesting. Do you notice um, he's done this here? Uh, I think this is really important. He's signalling signal that these lines are particularly important. And why? The former chaos... Putting in form and new fashion, new it may appear by uh, this, uh, uh, his works which underneath ensue uh, the uh, strife uh, did God and nature break and set in order due. Or due. If you think about the word undu, uh, due. That almost sounds like two, but why is that important? Well, because on the front of the elements of armoury, uh, we have that chaos. So he's really pointing to and indicating uh, that chaos uh, there in those lines. There's another one of those, actually, but I'll let you uh, find that for yourself. So we've got lots of twos going on, and it continues. We have quite a few uh, twos going on. This is all just in the epistle. Uh, to turn the truth uh, to toys and lies and of the self same rate. Hmm. So he's going to turn himself to toys and lies. Quite a few to twos. Um, the readers, therefore, earnestly admonish our to uh, be, to be, 
uh, to seek a further meaning and the letter gives to C. We've got quite a few there, haven't we? We've got to uh, seek and to see. Well, I'm hoping that you're starting to see all of these twos because there's a lot of them. And this, this isn't speculation. They are there for you. OK, uh, then if that in the crystal glass uh, uh, foul images they've found. So holding up the mirror to nature and he's found a foul image uh, resembling uh, folks foul visages and stand about it round for sure there is fables and not put in uh, whiting to um, so as you can as you can see he's he's really reflecting this is clearly to his father uh, for as there is no creature more divine than man as long as as reason hath the sovereignty and standeth firm and strong and to this day he is uh, in Westminster Abbey. Uh, the use of this same book, therefore, is this, that every man endeavouring for to know himself as nearly as he can, as though he in a chariot uh, sate well ordered, should direct uh, his mind by reason, the sway of virtue, and correct his fierce uh, affections with the bit of temperance so you can that this is uh, this is so apparent uh, he's reflecting on something horrendous he has done and the need uh, for virtue in his own life uh, that theseus badge of the ox in uh, the ascendants uh, when he went about his father's wrath to shun oh his father's wrath well who's this dedicated to robert dudley and he's talking about his father's wrath to shun I, I just think this is really obvious i'm sorry but i, I do to let your noble uh, courtesy and favor uh, ca countervail uh, my faults my faults were art or eloquence uh, art arthur artos uh, eloquence on thy behalf behalf doth uh, uh, say fail yeah so where my faults where my eloquence doth fail. Um, he's trying to make amends and he's doing, and he's trying to make amends by doing this phenomenal work. He's translating over to Metamorphoses for the first time uh, into English. Now, Robert Dudley was a, a keen supporter of the arts. He loved learning, he really encouraged it. So this is a quite a seminal work in the English language and he's taking this on as a 17 year old uh, gentleman. Which is which is incredibly impressive, but he's doing it probably because he feels such guilt and um, wow. So yeah, more twos uh, to travail uh, to enrich our tongue with knowledge heretofore uh, to all men's profit and delight and thy eternal fame and that which is a greater thing our native country may long time enjoy thy counsel and thy uh, tr uh, travel uh, to her stay. So he's doing the work. He's doing the work for his country to make amends for something uh, he has done. At, I think that says Warwick, I'm not entirely sure though. Um, your good Lord most humbly to command Arthur Golding, which is really, so this is really by De Beer. Hopefully this is quite apparent. I'm hoping it is. Uh, but also notice here, the first, the epistle was to Wano, the right, honourable uh, and singular. And he even tells you it's singular, which is, ah, man, man, I get that now. His singular good Lord. That singular is the O. Ah, I got it. Finally, um, I was wondering uh, what that singular was. Why? Because there you have the double to the sun. Um, and if you just see here, I've already gone through. I've, I've repeated it twice beforehand. Um, and every one gives light to other. So he's really saying he is the son of Robert Dudley here. Now, um, I'll just show you this um, because you're now going to see this perhaps in a different light. Here's Hamlet, his most autobiographical play. This is Act 1, Scene 2. Act 1, Scene 2. You could not make this up Um here we go. Two, 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 
2. I count that to be uh, 16. Uh, so there's 16 twos there. That's quite a lot of two. That is the figure of repetition in action. But that's not just it. Just as I showed you in the table of hard words, you've also got more cunning than meets the eye here, which you're not going to look. Uh, you're not going to see unless you're really trying to look for it. And here it is. You see that not? You met the not before. The two, if you're reading the other way, two, 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 cannot, and it is not, nor it cannot, you have your other two there, hold my tongue. And you have that two enter, interlaced uh, within that word in the final word there. So it really is telling you uh, what is going on here. And also, if you look, uh, you have here two. Now, I count that to be 24. Uh, which is a very important number for Edward de Vere. And I wouldn't be surprised um, if if that really is uh, uh, 24. Now, I should say you can, you might notice that you could make these between the lines, uh, but I'm not taking that because it's not directly uh, adjacent. So it's, that T seems to be in between uh, the O and the T. And likewise here, whereas this one is directly above it. Uh, and capitalised. So I've taken that uh, and also there's one here which I am allowing because it's two but there's just a space between it but it is directly next to it just with a little bit more space. Uh, so I count that to be uh, 24. Either way that is a lot of twos. Uh, statistically that is noticeable. Um, so why is this so important? Well, it just so happens in chapter 19 of The Art of English Posy, which we've already spoken about, same chapter, uh, we have the figure of repetition. And first, and it's the right at the beginning of chapter 19, and first of all others, your figure that worketh by iteration or repetition, or one word or clause doth much alter and affect the ear and also the mind of the hearer, and therefore is counted a very brave figure, both with the poets and the rhetoricians, uh, as this rep uh, repetition may be in seven sorts. Indeed it is. If you think Brexit means Brexit or education, 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 there's the figure of repetition at work, as all politicians uh, worth their salt. Uh, no. Uh, so um, if we have a look at this one, we have the doubler, the ploche or the, or the doubler. Um, uh, yet have we one sort of repetition which we call the doubler and it is as the next before a speedy iteration of one word. Well, we like the speedy dispatcher uh, in the same book for good reason, which is in uh, Shakespeare's coat of arms. We like uh, the word speedy very much. Uh, so speedy iteration of one word uh, by but with some little intermi intermission by inserting uh, one or two words between it is uh, as in a most excellent ditty written by Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, these two, can you see it? Two, two closing verses. Yet when I saw myself to you was true, I loved myself because myself loved you. So we've got two three times in the doubler and doubler uh, is mentioned twice as well. So it's telling you uh, about this figure of repetition and this too. You've got it here. Uh, now also be there many other sorts of repetition if a man would use them, but are nothing commendable. Remember, uh, he is nothing. So indeed, he is commending uh, this and therefore are not observed. He's even telling you here that you have two in not observed because frequently they're not going to be observed if you're not uh, looking for them. Um, as a vulgar rhymer who doubled one, if you double one, what do you get? I hope the answer will be two. Um, and look at, now this is, this is incredible. Okay, this is incredible. Um, if you weren't buying into this, just watch this. Of every verse there, thus adieu, adieu. Have a look at your Hamlet there. Adieu. You can't make that up. You literally can't make that up. Adieu, adieu, adieu. And then look, my face, my face. Oh God, oh God. 
can you see uh, how there is a, a direct correlation between this and the art of English poesy and in Hamlet uh, and in uh, Metamorphoses, which we're looking at now? There's a there's a direct correlation. You that there's there's too much commonality between it uh, not uh, to have a relationship. And these last recited be to no purpose. Well, who's no purpose? Edward de Beer, he's no purpose. Uh, B2. Now, that B2 is really important, uh, uh, as we'll see in a second. There's my lovely, really important again. Um, I'll work on that in my next video. Uh, for neither can ye say that it urges affection, nor that it beautifieth or enforceth the sense, nor hath any other subtlety in it. And therefore is a very foolish impertinency of speech and not a figure. So he's he's um, he's he, he's saying is that the opposite of what he's really meaning here. Um, he's telling you what he's doing, but he's uh, being very, uh, very obscuring in what he's saying. Uh, also notice here, actually, in this one, you have uh, the repetition of all, uh, which if you see, we've talked about all being important for um or 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 so we've got or being repeated uh, in this and this is only a, a segment uh, of this uh, section so just so you can see the figure of repetition uh, at work for you there um now to the reader we've spoken about already now the reason i wanted you to uh, be aware of what I was just saying was because we have in the first line of the to the reader to be I'm just going to put that up there for you I'm sure no doubt you are familiar with that to be or not to be that is the question uh, so if I just put this up as well because we've got something very very clever going on there you'll see that accent there's an accent over that e okay and remember, yeah, we have or deceit in accent. So he is telling you that he's doing something here, that deceit in accent. Uh, would not with the simple uh, lost offended to be. Um, well, let's just have a look. To be. To bestow. So to, to be, though. To be. And we have a to burst. To be. So we've got three times there our to be right at the start. Now, we vary slightly to G, uh, to T, uh, to superstition, uh, to, to E, you could say. So we, we're varying slightly. OK, to L, to we've got this to we've got another to B there. To T, uh, to impute an E on the end there, um, to uh, to B, another to B, to G. So you can you can hear regularly you can hear that two and the e to be uh, to lucre lucre to uh, to wrath this one's quite important but if we yield to uh, to self self lie lust to lucre to uh, wrath um, I'm sure he did uh, I think hot spurs quite hot for a reason uh, to be uh, to to too, too filthy. Um, to other things oft may and must agree. To the readers, um, let's read that because that's probably important. Uh, but leave them, but leave them to the readers. Will to take in sundry, sundry. We've got that word sundry again. Uh, wise as matters uh, uh, rising, giving uh, cause constructions to. We go again. Devise to devise. Um, it is a it is a mirror. It is a mirror holding that mirror up to nature again for thyself, thine own estate. I did tell you that word estate was important to see uh, the under feigned names of gods. It was the poets. Guys, under feigned names, he's telling you feigned names. Arthur Golding, this is not by Arthur Golding. To extol, too filthy, uh, and love 
becomes a bull. We're starting to talk about a Jove, sorry. Or well, you could read it as love as well, but Jove becomes a bull. We're talking about um, that transformation, a transformation to the ox. Uh, together, uh, to, 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 again, to see again the accent there, to see, together together to reason to reign that surely did the poets mean when it's such sundry wise we've got sundry rent to to, to. so hopefully you can see this and this is quite clear uh, so hid uh, the saving himself uh self i can't remember what that is so okay uh to be we've got more to be uh to Three, two, P, two, B. Uh, so we've got quite, a, we've got so many two Bs uh, going on here. Um, that's two the other way, not death. You have a two the other way. Um, to outward show, be holding vice to outward show. Uh, shoot two to conceive. So you, you can see we have so many uh, twos going on uh, here until had attained the end of my race so almost at the end um, to match mine author to match mine author I cannot make a count wherein, although for pleasant style I cannot make a count to match the author who in that all other uh, doth Surmount. So he clearly has Ovid on a pedestal and he's trying to match them. Um, I think uh, he does surpass Ovid uh, in time. Um, he's only 17 at this point, remember. Um, uh, gentle reader, to embrace, to the ear, uh, to the mind, to delight, to show, to be, again with that ex accent, uh, in reading the epistle uh, through thou shalt thy longing have uh, whosoever thou mayst find here in descriptions of the times to take to other to understand to know the thing that went before to see to the intent to com uh, to complain uh, the lively setting forth of things in this book I, I really like um, I give him counsel to abstain until he be more strong to abstain until he be more strong uh, to be Ulysses to be and to his fault and look at the last two two lines of this then let him also mark the pain that doth thereof ensue and hold himself content with that that to his fault is due and as we said we know um, from what also happened in this year uh, what his fault is due and he is trying to make amends uh, to his father by doing this uh, phenomenal uh, work and, and this is this is um this, i suppose is this is occam's razor this is entirely occam's razor um like it, it, it Ovid's metamorphosis was the most influential thing, arguably other than the Bible, on, on Shakespeare's work. This explains it. He translated it to English for the first time when he was 17. Uh, so there we go. There's, uh, there's Artos, Arthur Artos, uh, the bear, um, with his ragged staff. Hopefully that, that makes more sense. Uh, now, I should say this comes from a important manuscript that I would suggest uh, scholars who would like to do some further research uh, to have a look at. You also have this wonderful um, uh, coat of arms here of Edward, uh, Edward, I think, the Confessor. That's important uh, because as I show you in uh, the uh, um, Shakespeare's coat of arms, uh, you have this window here of Edward the Confessor. And after you've you, you may want to go watch uh, that video and have a look at that window and some other windows. Uh, so there we go. Thank you very much for your patience, as always, with putting up with me rabbiting on about this stuff. 
Um, thank you very much uh, and um, enjoy the rest of your day.